welcome to today's webinar, A Game Changer Approach to Poverty Reduction Strategy and Evaluation. My name is Mark Kabaj, and I'm here today with Mark Holmgren, Director of Tamarack Institute's uh, Vibrant Communities Canada Initiative. And uh, for those of you who do not have a, a link to the, uh, had had a chance to see the paper that we're going to speak about today, it is actually uh, a hyperlink has been put into the chat box, so you can draw from it there. Uh, Mark is no stranger to Tamarack, and we'll speak with him shortly. Prior to his role as Director of Vibrant Communities Canada, he was working with Tamarack as a thought leader for several years, and he delivered a number of workshops on topics such as upside-down thinking, prototyping, community engagement, and more. And many of you who have been to uh, the, these events have seen Mark perform his original music and spoken word. So he's a very talented guy on multiple fronts. Uh, he, we were lucky enough to have him join Tamarack in January 2016 to lead the Vibrant Communities Initiative and to sit on the team of directors. He, uh, he's got a lot of background that he brings to this work and this conversation today, including executive leadership with two Edmonton-based inner-city human service agencies focused on addressing poverty and homelessness, as well as providing consultation to a number of groups on issues related to things like social development, uh, housing, organizational change, strategy, development, and re leadership. Uh, most recently, Mark served as the CEO of the Bissell Centre, where he led a team of 130 staff, which were delivering Housing First services, uh, assertive street outreach, family and children's services, and programs in the areas of mental health, addictions, and homelessness prevention, as well as FS, FASD interventions and employment services. We uh, know Mark <coughs> not only for his talents, but his big picture view and ability to work on the ground. And so he's a, he's a leader, he's an innovator, and he's a, a renaissance artist. And we're happy to have you today, Mark, for this conversation. So welcome. Thanks, Mark. I appreciate the kind words. and. Uh Really happy that uh, you and I are on the call together. Well, and we, we, we have a chance to talk about something we've often talked about, you know, face to face and informally uh, in lots of different situations, Mark. And, and it's this idea of evaluation, complex issues like poverty, and uh, uh, trying to make sense of the work we're, we're doing so we can do even better work. So before we get into that, though, tell us, for those who don't know, a little bit more about Vibrant Communities Canada. Uh, the Vibrant Communities Canada and the emphasis on cities reducing poverty. Sure. Uh, Vibrant Communities Canada uh, is a Tamarack initiative that's been around since 2002, um, working with cities and uh, communities around the country on poverty reduction. So it's pan Canadian. Uh, we're a learning community uh, around poverty reduction and collective impact and uh, doing whatever we can to help our members, folks working on the ground uh, to share uh, their learnings and success stories, their struggles, uh, and uh, do some peer-to-peer -peer networking as well in order for us collectively to address poverty in our, in, our, uh, in our communities. There's right now, I think, 54 members, and our goal is to hit 100 over the next couple of years of local cities, towns, regions and even some uh, associations now that are interested in joining us. So we're, we've been around for a while. We hope to be around even longer. Our deepest passion is to end poverty in Canada, which is something I think we share with everybody on the call. Well, and Mark, Vibrant Communities has, if, if one wanted to delve into the chapter a bit more, it's, uh, to the story a bit more, it has multiple chapters, and part of the story of this call is trying to align the next iteration of learning and evaluation processes for vibrant communities with this next chapter in its evolution. So we'll get into that. Uh, but before we do, let's talk a little bit about evaluation. So you, given your work, you've got so much experience of, you know, using evaluation in a leadership role. You've periodically uh, employed evaluation techniques in your consulting and management work. Uh, and yet you you are not a full-time evaluator. That's not how you, you perceive your, your craft. That's just something that's embedded in your work. So knowing that, why did you feel the urge to write uh, an article on evaluation? Uh, for, well, for some of the reasons you just stated, I, I, I've worked with evaluation over the course of my career in community service. I, I don't see myself as an evaluator or a thought leader around evaluator like uh, like you are, Mark, but I do see myself as a strategist and someone who's led quite a few uh, initiatives that have required a variety of types of evaluation. But one of the unique challenges that we face as vibrant communities is how do we evaluate 
uh, the work of 55 plus organizations or, or roundtables who are uh, working locally, who are independent, who uh, have di may have different or varied priorities, and trying to understand the progress that we're having in reducing poverty. And I think all of us, wherever we're located, uh, find that it's complicated, and that, that's where this quote comes from. Trying to tie in, you know, my background as a physician, I guess, in terms of the metaphor, we, we all want to find ways to um, get get to in, to demonstrate that the work we're doing is is making a difference. But there seems to be so much noise around how we do that. Uh, everybody has many uh, masters that they have to deal with, and all of them seem to want evaluation, and. Um, I, my experience as a leader and a strategist has been that often our traditional evaluation approaches just don't really help us as much as they could or should to get to uh, the music we really want to play around demonstrating progress in poverty reduction. I also think the motivation here for me was kind of six, uh, at least six challenges that I think we face uh, in doing evaluation. I'm sure there's many more. But one of them is uh, we have so many to do for so many different funders and stakeholders uh, that our capacity as poverty reduction practitioners and leaders is in how do we actually uh, respond to all of the demands and interests and in, uh, how to do evaluation in our work, whether it's locally with funders or locally to the community or locally to our the, each, each group's own uh, poverty reduction steering group, uh, and then also as part of a network. So capacity was a big was a big challenge. Also, poverty reduction is a long game. It's not easily, or nor can it be divided into annual segments. And so sometimes to get to results requires a lot of work over time to finally get to the kinds of uh, numbers or data that really demonstrates impact. And if we just see things in annual cycles, we miss the, the whole picture. Another challenge we face is how do we equate outcomes with impact? So outcomes for, say, a program are one thing, but the overall impact of, of poverty reduction initiatives across the community are harder to discern and harder to get to. So how, how do we do that as best we can? Fourth is in all evaluations, we need to recognize that not everything is measurable. That there are things that we do that, that point to progress. There are things that we do that make a difference that don't necessarily tie neatly uh, to data uh, and trends. Um, and I'm I'm interested, uh, as I know you are, Mark. In how do we use evaluation as a key component of how we learn about our work? How we adapt to things along the way where we discover something may not be working as well as we want it to or is not working at all while other things are working well. How do we how do we use that information to inform future strategy in terms of going forward? So these are just some of the some of the um, challenges that I've had in mind and which helped me look at or, or prompted me to, to write the paper. So I loved uh, when you were chatting about that paper and kind of mucking around with bylines or, or um, metaphors. I, I was a big fan of this one, the one with the, the music and the noise. And I think that is a, that's a, that's a nicer way of saying something that is a standard challenge in evaluation. How do you make feedback, uh, make them into, make feedback useful signals, not noise? And you put an artistic bent onto this and you've just shared with us what in my mind is sort of the five itches or key questions that prompted you to write this song, which we'll call for the moment a paper, but really is a song in many ways. Uh, so thanks for giving us that, Mark. Uh, this uh, question, uh, it's a nice segue into the next challenge, which is when one looks at evaluation, part of the reason there's so much noise, and you, you identified this, was there are so many different purposes or users and uses of data. So generating data for accountability purposes to external folks, that's one thing. Uh, generating data for the core leadership group to do strategic learning about the initiative overall is another. Uh, generating data and feedback loops for groups working on a particular part of the initiative is yet another. So sorting out this 
who is the primary user and what do they need it for is a key thing. So when you are thinking of, of trying to craft an evaluation strategy that's really useful for the next iteration of vibrant communities, who are the who are the primary users and uses you have uses you have in mind? Well, the, there's really two groupings of them that are the primary users, and they're on they're on the slide. But uh, our first priority is how can we create an, an evaluation approach that's of benefit to the members of Vibrant Communities Canada, yep. uh, and you know the roundtables that are doing the work, the staff that are doing the work. How can we create uh, an evaluation that people actually are uh, hopefully uh, eager to participate in because the return on what they get on the other end is helpful to their work, not just in terms of understanding what's going on or what they've done, but in terms of what other, uh, what their peers are doing across the country that they may be able to learn from, and also what they can offer their peers uh, in terms of uh, successful approaches or learnings that they've had around the work they do and adjustments that they've made. And of course, uh, the whole VC CRP network uh, is important as, as well. So our own staff, Tamarack Institute as a learning community, needs to learn as we go as well around what's working out there. How do we delve into issues that arise or challenges that arise out of an evaluation? How do we create learning opportunities that help our members uh, and other practitioners learn and grow around the work they're doing and also contribute with one another about uh, what kinds of learnings that that we need to have. I'm, I'm sure there's others who might benefit, like funders might benefit, and uh, we can use some of the findings of evaluations or, or with our uh, with governments and uh, other stakeholders. But these are the, the two primary ones that I have in mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing, uh, uh, an important point to raise for any kind of evaluation, to be clear as you are about this, because in earlier discussions of this, Mark, we had there was moments where there was this ambition of creating an evaluation framework that would work for everyone, like a standard framework that would work for, you know, the very unique circumstances of 54 communities and came to the conclusion fairly quickly that that wasn't possible, that groups had their own evaluation frameworks that were customized to their own local event and we couldn't figure something out that was standardized. So this coming uh, to this conclusion that you could add value on looking for patterns and themes across sites, th that that is a real doable and clear and strategic uh, thing around which to organize that you're about to describe now. Yeah, I, I think so. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. Yeah. So give us, uh, there's lots of pieces to this. You've done such nice work on this, but there's really three major components to the, the story here. What, what are they? Well, we started out earlier this year, uh, Mark, by designing, and you were a part of that design, kind of a three-stage evaluation uh, uh, process, and we issued what we call a membership survey, which we thought was a fairly straightforward survey, but one of the things we recognized in getting at some of the things that are on the screen around uh, that stream was it, it took our members longer than we envisioned to be able to uh, engage in that survey and to respond to it, and I, I don't offer that as any kind of criticism, it was more uh, understanding as we went along just how much work it is for our members to participate in uh, in a tool that helps uh, us collect information and share it back, and uh, which we'll be doing if we haven't done already. It's uh, our, our sharing of that membership report coming out, and so uh, the things that we covered in, in in that stream we think are helpful to our members in terms of understanding across the country how groups are structured, how they govern, how they engage community, the partnerships they have, and also what their priorities are in terms of uh, the plans that they have or the plans they are developing. As we moved to, to start thinking about phase two is when I started to get a little um, nervous about uh, kind of our original intent. So we were really basing our evaluations uh, primarily on the uh, social, um, I always forget the word, just this, uh, the sustainability uh, livelihoods framework and, um, and really taking what I thought was a a, 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 dat, a, a primarily a data approach to collecting information, and, and as I thought about the capacities, uh, capacity realities of our membership, and also the nature of what we were trying to do, it led to conversations inside our organization with you and with a few others around 
there's got to be a better way to to start looking at how we do impact that that recognizes the differences and the diversity of our membership and it also recognizes we can't go forward with any kind of tool. I don't even know how I would design one that would allow us to get evaluated data about everything that all of our members are doing. The change stories is a is a smaller piece of the in terms of workload, but very much important too. And that'll come in the third phase in terms of let's back up our findings now with some success stories that really help us understand and crystallize the progress that we're having. So we're really, the game changer approach came out of kind of a rethink, uh, which is, uh, you know, compatible with the whole the whole idea of learning and adapting around the work we do. So um, uh, we're, we're looking at how do we restructure that phase two and then build phase two to come up. Mm -hmm. So the membership survey just sort of get a, a general sense of the characteristics of your your members. Uh, number two, uh, a, a sense of trying to get some data on the impact, and number three, m more narrative-based stuff to get even deeper insight into significant change initiatives and stories. Yeah, well said. Yeah, ni nicely nested components, all distinct but interrelated. So this is the. Uh, you're going to elaborate a little bit on this with this game changer idea. So this is sort of the background. And as you go forward with this, you, you there are some questions you're wrestling with that we don't have to get into today, Mark. But I think I th thought we we thought it would be important for the crowd to know that uh, the imp the design and implementation of this is not necessarily going to be straightforward. And there's at least seven things to pay attention to. Yeah, I don't I don't want to go. I don't well. We don't have time to go into detail with all the questions, but some of them flow out of what I was just talking about. So. How can evaluation be comprehensive while also addressing the realities of time and capacity of our members? Yep. Uh, and that connects to the next question: Is how do uh, is there a way to focus evaluation efforts on quote unquote what matters most? Uh, and is there a simpler way uh, to go? I'm concerned about the reliability and consistency of data from year to year. That's cr critical to understanding progress in a long game of poverty reduction, and so. Uh, we want to look at how we address that uh, and how do we um, look at uh, data and information as signals of progress, maybe more so than proof of results, because I think proof of results is more elusive than sometimes we care to admit. And again, the whole learning and adaptation and strategy building that can come from great evaluation, not to mention innovation, a key interest of ours. Yep. Yep, so these are great design challenges. Uh, they don't tell you how to deal with them, but they say keep these things in mind when you're getting to the mechanics of all this. So Mark, as you did this, you had um, a moment, this was your moment, uh, something that, that uh, however this stuff happens <laughs> when people are being creative, this notion of a game changer, and we want to speak about that. And I, I, what struck me about this idea in general was that this is as much, if not more, a strategy insight that has evaluative implications. You, you, it may have come to you while you were wrestling with evaluation, but this is as important for thinking about strategy uh, for poverty reduction or any complex initiative. If we understand strategy to mean essentially trying to discern what is the highest and best use of a group's time. So this idea of a game changer, again, it came through the back door of evaluation, but this is has got more um, use and uh, applicability beyond evaluation. It's, it's a big strategy uh, contribution. What Tell us about this thing called the game changer. Yeah, I, you know, when originally when I titled the paper, I didn't have the word strategy in it. And, and as, I, as I kept writing it and thinking about it, uh, I came to the same realization that, that you just articulated. Mark, and the, the genesis of some of this came out of conversations I was having as a member of the Mayor of Edmonton's task force on, on uh, eliminating poverty in, in our city. And um, at one point in the conversation, I actually invoked the name Game Changer and said, look, we have so many strategies and so many actions under each strategy. Uh, it's like we have something that's a mile wide and an inch deep. How can we, how can we focus more on those things that if we, if we address them, would have the largest impact across our community because of their, what I call their cascading effect uh, in addressing needs. So 
this definition is about a, you know a, a, a priority area or strategy that aim that not only aims to deliver on its own specific goals or outcomes, but also elicits an array of other significant positive outcomes that cast, that cascade both within and outside of its area of emphasis, and can have profound impact on on um, uh, how we address poverty. And I I I, I think I'll, I'm going to talk a little bit soon about what the benefits are, and then give you an example from as affordable housing, for example, is having that cascading effect. But I also noticed in when we reviewed, um, when our team reviewed what we were getting from the phase one evaluation, is that there are there were quite a few uh, commonalities around uh, things that groups were addressing that seemed to reflect this notion of a game changer. And so I found that encouraging, which furthered my thinking around. So how do we get at measuring progress around? those game changer priorities. Yep, yep, yep. It's um, um, the the application to the Edmonton case studies or uh, one that people could refer to, I guess, Mark, that, that that strategy is online. I think there were six game changers in Edmonton. There were, yeah. Uh, and so why don't you give us an example of that. Uh, refer to the one that you have that we've chatted about and, and if you feel the urge to refer to the Edmonton case study, that would be great as well. Well, uh, yeah, I'll talk. I'll talk about the housing one, and I'll mention one from Edmonton yep. on the slide after this one. But uh, as um, as we began, okay, I'll, I'll do that one first. Yep. So uh, let's do. Let's talk about safe and affordable housing. And we know that if if folks have access to safe and secure and, and suitable housing to their needs, that is fundamental to their lives. And uh, can help people not only have a home, but create a base from which they can escape poverty, uh, perhaps get a job, uh, participate more fully in the community. We know that stable housing uh, helps people stabilize their health issues, mental health issues. Uh, we know it provides a safe base for children uh, and uh, adds value to their ability to participate in school and as well as, as socialize. All those things are cascading effects. If you have a place to live, you, you have easier access to health services, you have easier access to schools, you can start to look at the future in terms of work and, and furthering your education. Uh, door, doors, opportunities open up for you just because you have a safe place and an affordable place to live. And uh, so, an or you know, a community that uh, if, if, for example, a community could solve all of its affordable housing issues or challenges, there would be many cascading effects that would happen to the folks who are now no longer in tenuous housing or on the street or bounced around every six months. Uh, it, the benefits would be huge. And th I, I picked this one as an example because I have deep experience in creating housing uh, for, for a variety of uh, part of population ranging from homeless women to folks with schizophrenia to senior citizens and, and young people. So in all those cases and all the uh, housing, uh, social housing I've created or helped create and in all the programs that I've led, these cascading effects were evident uh, in their work. In the Edmonton example, affordable housing, transportation, early childhood are among the game changers. But the one that actually emerged out of that conversation uh, was uh, racism and discrimination, and uh, we realized that if we if we could turn the turn the tables on on racism, racist attitudes, discrimination that's embedded in employment uh, uh, in, in organizations looking at employment, uh, all kinds of opportunities uh, across housing, jobs, social inclusion would be included if we could actually start dealing with racism as a major uh, uh, barrier and a, a major way that folks are disenfranchised from community life. So the, the, the intent here, um, actually if we go back to the benefits slide, um, is, is that if we take a, a strategic approach to identifying game changers uh, as defined here, uh, that that deals with a number of things. I won't read all these things to you. You can read them yourselves, but we all know that we do not have the resources 
to address everything that we want to do. And so sometimes we get stuck in a place where we say we can't do this, we can't do that. And maybe this is, um, or I'm hoping that this is one approach that helps to crystallize where most of our attention, time, and resources should go while recognizing that uh, there's an old Taoist saying, for every yes there is a no. We can't do everything, we can't measure everything, so how do we how do we set priorities? And I think looking at game changers as an approach to doing that can be helpful for our members uh, across the country as well as for governments and so forth. Uh, it helps facilitate what outcomes we identify. It helps clarify how we're going to work together in terms of mutually reinforcing activities. Uh, it focuses our communication. It gives us an ability to uh, communicate and dialogue with community around game changers, that's where movements are formed. They're formed out of those large, big change initiatives that people can rally around. Uh, not that the community's not going to rally around a poverty reduction plan that has 75 strategies or 150 activities to support them. Uh, it also influences funding and research priorities. So how do we start looking at research from a game changer approach? Um, so we think the potential benefits here are huge, uh, including signaling policy and systems reform. Uh, if we could make, if we could change some of our systems that relate to game changer strategies and priorities, uh, they too would have a cascading effect or contribute to that cascading effect of game changers. So Mark, those refer to that. You really illustrate the point there that these, most of these benefits just re re are about kind of more strategic leadership and, and choices about where to spend time and effort. I mean, that, again, it's what's the highest and best use of a group's time. And it seems to me that this gets directly at um, the idea of signals versus noise. If you only have so much time and energy, you would be focusing on to what extent are you moving the needle or making a difference on game changers, and if you have the time and effort, to then go track the, the ripple effects of that, the cascading effects. Is that right. what you're getting at? That's what I'm getting at. I, I think um, there, there's, uh, with every model we look at, whether it's a this, this approach or collective impact or whatever framework we use in our work, we have choices to make. But we, and, and those choices are often about choosing this, uh, in a sense, over that. And so how do we do that? How do we find those things that really are true priorities that where if we focus on these things, we have, we're, we have uh, more chance of success, more chance of rallying our stakeholders and the public around these particular things. Uh, and um, many of, uh, if not all, of the game changers that, that, uh, that we would come up with would resonate with the general public as well. So. Yep. Um, I, I, and I, I so I think it helps bring that clarity. Um, and I like I like the the idea, the metaphor of moving from noise to music because as a musician, I'm surrounded by noise too. And mm -hmm. the idea of creating a song or is is to create some clarity and focus and context within uh, kind of a hubris that I'm that I live in I and mean, we all live in. So that's where that metaphor came from. Yep. And Mark, the, that you've also just, as, as an illustration, kind of surfaced some possible indicators for the, the game change around housing. Let's see if we can go to that one. So this, uh, if you, you um, just describe these indicators a bit, because they're, they're really useful. And what strikes me is that sort of, uh, there's multiple indicators to consider in a game changer. Yeah, and I'd, I'd ask the folks who are with us today to see these, uh, understand we're talking about possible game changers. We're still exploring these. but one of the central uh, themes around the game changer approach to strategy as well as evaluation is how do we show progress and um, how do we understand contribution to that progress, say as a roundtable in a particular community. And, and if we understand the long game of poverty reduction, sometimes uh, things need a formal plans in place before anything's going to happen. So if there hasn't been one and now there is, we see that as progress. Yep. Certainly, the, the plan has to be implemented, but implemented. But uh, no plans tend to produce very little work or, or very chaotic work. Yeah, policy and systems change. So, uh, what policy and systems change in the housing uh, example? 
uh, have existed locally or and or provincially that help uh, uh, advance affordable housing, safe housing. You know, the example I give is is uh, is changes in how cities work around a mix of market and social housing and new developments, or bylaw changes, or those kinds of things. Uh, how do we look at the progress that's happening in a community around different kinds of housing stock? What's being built? Are, are we shifting? Uh, are shelter numbers shifting downward as affordable housing is going upwards? And are we paying attention not just to affordable housing generically, but also to supportive and special needs housing? There's there's data in every community around what's what's the trend around rental and utility costs? Are they going up? Or are they going down? Yeah. We need to understand too when we're using indicators, what's what's not just improving, but what's working against us that we need to respond to. Homeless counts are, are, are a good example in in what's going on in communities and uh, for those who have them. Uh, are we seeing uh, wait lists for subsidized housing? In Edmonton, the wait list for Edmonton housing is about three years long. So at some point, will we see that decreasing for the right reasons, not just because we've created more stringent uh, intake procedures. Uh, I mentioned bylaw changes. Uh, do we have do we have programs in place now that are looking at uh, preventing homelessness, uh, helping to ward off evictions, and doing interventions that help uh, folks who are facing evictions not face them again? And then generically, are there other innovations that are really uh, promoting um, our ability in a community to uh, to house people more effectively? Uh, more relevantly in terms of what they need and uh, more efficient. So these are these are some of the game changes we're looking at uh, in, in terms of how could we work with our members to identify the, these kinds of progress. Uh, maybe we call them progress indicators. Yep. So just just a few examples. Yep. So uh, and it seems to me that when you look at these, the um, the challenge is to say there is a, a, a lots of possibilities here. In some ways, this looks like a wholesale list of possibilities, but each group, when they're thinking about game changes, would probably have to choose, like retail them, be, be thoughtful about which indicators most reflect their particular strategy around that game changer. That, uh, well, that's right. Yeah. 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 No, it's excellent, Mark. Uh, it's excellent. It, it uh, makes me want to just start working on one of these things right now to pull a game changer out of the air and, and saying uh, what would this look like? Uh, what kind of cascading effects would it generate? What the what would the measurement implications be? Uh, we just got a couple of minutes left, um, Mark. So let's focus on uh, one question about what we might be leaving behind on the table and just get an understanding of where you're going next with this. So you mentioned that we all make choices with these things. Uh, what what choices? What do you think you're leaving behind? Or what might we miss? Or what are some of the the, the limitations of uh, using a game cha game changer approach, particularly as it relates to valuation? Sure. I mean, um, there's a yin and yang to everything, Mark, as you well know. Um, so one of the challenges is for us is how do we identify game changers, uh, and what's the rationale, and how do we identify progress indicators? And we're drawing on a lot of information we have from our members, so that they're informing our thinking around this but also uh, doing some research around uh, things like affordable housing, transportation, early childhood to understand uh, what some of those game changers might be inside um, inside those particular themes. We know, for example, uh, in early childhood, uh, or, I'm sorry, in terms of addressing um, high school graduation, that one of the game changer benchmarks around doing that is grade three reading. So if, if kids are, are reading at or above grade three, their chances of graduating from high school are much greater than if they're not. So that's a game changer indicator. Uh, we, we need a design that fits a diverse BC membership. So uh, it, not everybody's doing the same thing that every way. Plans are relevant to local communities. So even in some of the indicators that we might put forward, some groups may not be working on them and wouldn't be able to contribute necessarily to the evaluation and we need to make sure they understand that doesn't mean necessarily a bad thing and maybe the fact that we've identified some of these indicators uh, that they're not working on maybe that'll help inform strategy. Uh, we need to make sure we're having clear communication with our members along the way as well as key stakeholders and funders and I've had the conversation as you know Mark with a couple of our funders who's, who are on side with 
uh, looking at moving in this direction and see some of the benefits that uh, would come to them by taking a game changer approach. Um, this is, uh, I don't know if this is a new approach, but we think there's an innovation here in terms of, uh, of moving forward this way. So how do we, how do we put forward what we're, what our, our framework will be for uh, soliciting information from our members while understanding there's an iterative nature of this work and we need to be prepared to flex and change along the way. Um, and uh, a big one, the next one I, I, I mentioned before, but the big one for me is we also need to understand that game changers can have a horizontal effect. We don't want to silo them. Mm -hmm. You know, affordable housing and public transportation, put them together, uh, and maybe together, if we're addressing them effectively, there's also some cascading effects that we need to pay attention to that wouldn't be evident if we were just looking at them in silos. Yep. So, yep. So that's some of them, yeah. No, it's great, and it's great, and uh, some of these are just standard evaluation challenges but have a, this extra curl on uh, added to it by focusing on game changers. Mark, we were at time here uh, um, and we do have a lot of questions but maybe just to end off here, what are your next steps around the game changing work and how can people stay in touch on this to see how it's progressing? You, you bet. So we're still working on this. Uh, my team's working on this. Allison Homer who's one of our lead staff around evaluation is working on this. In fact, she's working on putting forward uh, some thinking we have around uh, how game changers relate to policy, the policy clearinghouse we're developing, and uh, you you will see posted uh, on our website blogs that relate to game changers, examples that we see of, of what we call game changers, in which we're soliciting feedback from people. Uh, we're, before we put anything out to members, we're going we're gonna to beta test it learn from it, see what's working, see what's not. Uh, and uh, we, need to, we need to look at how we structure ourselves internally around how do we learn from this, this approach so that we can foster some great learning opportunities uh, for our membership. Yeah. Excellent. Well, and then another case to become a member. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Mark, yeah. excellent. It's a nice introduction. It's an excellent paper. Uh, Thank you for that. We're now going to turn ourselves over to the question and answer period. And sure. we encourage you, if you haven't done it already, everyone, to submit your questions through the, uh, in the control panel uh, on your webinar. And we're going to do our best to get all of them. And we do have a number of questions in front of us now. So, Mark, I'm just going to go through some of those, and, and we'll accumulate more as the discussion unfolds. Uh, this first one, I'm going to throw you a relatively easy one, uh, but, it, but it's worth emphasizing because I don't know if we touched on it as much as uh, we, we might have. Have you thought, this comes from, uh, from Allison, uh, have you thought about doing a collection of the, using the change, the most significant change method to collect stories? Have I thought about attaching game changers to that? Well, you as a methodology for, for collecting data, that's called the most significant change right. process. That's where you ask people to collect stories and to describe why they're significant for them, and then you look for patterns and themes. And I, I think that's what you had in mind for the third when you talked about change stories in the framework. Yeah, I, I, that's our intent. And so uh, I'm interested in the question because we looked at most significant change stories to be an extension then of the work we've done around uh, identifying uh, uh, progress and patterns around the, the game changers that we uh, wound up evaluating. What I'm intuiting or inferring, uh, assuming from the comment is perhaps we should see it both ways and think about some significant change stories and by um, reviewing them see if we can identify patterns that point to game changers. So, uh, I, I'm intrigued by that, and I think it's something we should look at. Well, and, and for everyone who hasn't seen it, if you Google most significant change, it's such an elegant resource and a methodology for collecting and analyzing data. And Mark, just as you uh, you review the comments yourself, Allison also uh, suggested uh, collecting stories via video, just you know from camera phones, etc. And it even expands the number of people who can be involved and provide insight on these things. So thanks, Allison. That's an excellent insight. Um, Here's a, another question from Myona. Uh, how are the people impacted by the game changer involved in identifying the, the game changer itself and the strategies associated with it? Well, we're, 
Yeah, it, this is a, a, a kind of an iterative process for us with our membership. So the, the, the membership survey, one of the questions we asked or what, was like a two-stage question. What are you working on? So we want to see all the things they're working on, but then what are what do you identify as your three to five priorities so that you're devoting most of your attention and, and work? And um, so we're collecting that and then looking for patterns across our membership that might help us understand commonalities around the big change items that they're working on and how that relates to the game changer approach. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be putting out uh, postings in one pagers around are thinking around game changers by uh, each uh, team, so to speak, uh, housing, transportation, and so forth, uh, giving people examples from our members in, in, uh, in particular, but perhaps elsewhere as well, uh, what what we think is going on in the in, across the country that connects to this way of thinking, and then looking for a feedback, and then the beta testing uh, the beta testing stage. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, working with a group of our members around here's here's how uh, here's the tool or tools that we've developed to try to get at this. Uh, what do you think? Do they work? Are we missing anything? Mm -hmm. uh, and so forth. I also think that in the when we go forward, we've talked about look we're going to identify eight to ten eight to ten maybe game changers, but we need to leave room in our exchanges with our members to identify. What might be a local game changer for them that isn't necessarily identified by us as something that's a game changer across the country? Well, Mark, I think that's a very good point because I, I think for us to we we have to remind ourselves of this a lot and and it'd be useful for people on the call to to um, fully under uh, appreciate this distinction that you're using game changers at the national level for a national level audience, but the idea right. itself is applicable, but in different ways at the local level. So you're saying let's be open to additions to the menu of game changers, but at the local level, this idea plays out in a slightly different way, and, and people can come up with their own unique ways to have citizens and people most affected by poverty, et cetera, to participate in this process. Perhaps That's I, right. I, I, yeah. We want to collect that uh, information, Mark, and we want yeah. to learn from it and, and, and share it across the, across the VCC network because it may spark some thinking across the country about something that's going on in one community that's not yet happening in another. Yeah, yeah, it's excellent. Mark, there's so many good questions here and comments. Um, I'm going to, uh, here's one that you, I think you speak to directly in your paper, uh, and this is from Shakira, and we've got time for about three more questions here. Regarding progress over proof, does this mean we should find a balance with evaluation when appropriate and focus on action when not? I think there's there there Shakira is referring to those uh, tensions. Yeah, I, I I'm not trying to say proof and progress are either or um, proposition. I I think that part of our challenges that we've had with evaluation, one is thinking we can prove everything, two thinking we can actually attribute that proof to uh, the work we've done in in clear direct ways. Uh, and, and I think there's certainly times when um, data points to prog points in um, measurable ways uh, to to the impact we're having on the population. But yeah. progress progress um, I think needs more emphasis because because of the long game of poverty reduction, really the long game of all the work that we that we like to do in community change efforts, and to start recognizing that. There are things happening in the community this year that aren't necessarily impacting the needle, but they're prerequisites uh, for doing so. And we need to be able to understand how progress works that help uh, that leads us towards the ability to measure the communities. And that, that's one of the emphasis that we're trying to include in our design. Well, another nice segue in there, Mark. I mean, uh, helpful answer again, and that there's not necessarily a conflict, but these are two different, these are multiple things to consider when you're trying to design these things. Uh, you, you mentioned that this, the purpose of the framework is to provide feedback, looking for patterns and themes that would be useful for the strategic thinking of all the the members of VC. 
uh, a, let's put ourselves in the place of someone local, which again you have lots of experience with uh, given your role in Edmonton and the poverty reduction strategy. Let's think of this game changer idea from a different perspective. How do you see, this is from Pam, how do you see current and potential funders or sponsors moving in this direction when it comes to you know, using game changers? Do you, very good for strategic learning. What, can you anticipate that, Mark? Or have, you, or have you tested this idea with funders? Well, uh, that's, a, that's a super question because uh, you know I've, I've sat on the funding side of things when I worked with United Way and I've also sat on funding committees for other funders. Uh, and often funders are, um, as we all know, set in their ways about how they do things. My experience, which is right now, is with uh, our funders. So uh, is uh, they've been included in the conversations about this approach, quite enthusiastic about it and interested in how it will roll out and how it can impact uh, their work. So um, this is why the whole communication aspect of, that I mentioned earlier uh, with funders, both uh, coming from our own members but also from Tamarack as a national-wide uh, movement, so to speak, is critical so that we're continu we continue to write write about it, we'll continue to share results that come out of it, uh, and to start trying to position game changers as a, a viable way of funders looking at how do they prioritize and allocate limited dollars towards things that matter the most, towards things that have the biggest impact. So I, I don't have a magic bullet answer for that, but uh, we don't, we've got to start showing uh, I, I guess some evidence that this is a good way of thinking about our work, both from a strategic point of view and also in terms of understanding the progress we're having in ending poverty across Canada. Well, and you you said no magic solution uh, or answer, but but your practice uh, there's there's some uh, there's some application there that you've involved your funders from the very beginning, Mark. In fact, you raised this as questions. In fact, uh, you, you were musing about the challenges of trying to measure these outcomes with your funders. And uh, this conversation has been uh, a, a joint one ever since the beginning. So perhaps engaging funders from the get-go is, is part of the, the answer. Yeah, I think including them in, in the conversation, uh, including folks who have a critical mind who are going to ask questions about uh, things that help us further the design of it. So sometimes folks have a great questions, even if they're resisting in this direction, that need to be addressed. Yep, yep. Mark, I just, there's lots of good questions and comments here. I'm going to have to make some choices about which ones, given the amount of time, and try and look at slightly different themes. So let's see if we can um, touch quickly on the following two. Uh, the First, uh, the first one's clearly an evaluation one. Do you, I don't think you have, but do you anticipate a kind of a standard methodology or pattern of practice for eventually selecting game change indicators? And I, and I know it's too early for that because you're still in the, in the early days of this, but in your head, can you imagine ever coming up with a, a practice or a tools or techniques for, for indicators? Well, uh, standards, tools, and practices have different nuances to me. So, um, you're, and you're right. We're 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 in the development stage of this. We're and uh, I'm pleased with the progress we're making, but we're not there yet. I I think ideally it'd be great if we could have a standardized approach to doing this. I think at the very least we can we can be having some tools that help guide local groups uh, and uh, practitioners in uh, maybe understanding and identifying what a game changer is within their local context, <coughs> as opposed to a formula, I guess. Of how do you standardize an approach? So, uh, I'm, I I I think there's the answer is somewhere in the middle, so to speak. Um, I'm not sure we'll come up with a, a one size fits all way of doing it. Uh, I'd love it if we could, but I certainly think we can come up with a, a process that helps uh, our, our stakeholders and helps us uh, identify and determine what game changers are, and then how do we work with them? Yeah, and so and and like anything, the contribution that you make will be r relevant to your work. But uh, people will need to experiment with this, and I think there is lots of good uh, material out there about the art and science of selecting indicators. The curl here will be: is there something new with the game changer idea? And it does sound like 
the key thing. If the essence is this idea of cascading effects, high leverage and cascading effects, that's the story. Does have, focusing on an outcome with cascading effect change the way you think of indicators? Right. Yeah. There's so much out there already. Mark, one last thing. Uh, just uh, several people have started throwing out ideas of what they think a game changer is. So let's just go back to the reality of poverty reduction and what has a disproportional impact. Uh, just muse on this for a second. Do you think having neighborhood uh, hubs uh, are game changers? Well, I put me on this. Uh, probably put me in. Go ahead. Uh, so let me try to um, I'll try to answer that question, but, but preface it with a few things. I think game ch the whole idea of a game changer mindset can um, be dealt with in different ways. So you can deal with it at a ma more of a macro level around uh, things like housing and transportation, uh, or or um, mental health, or those kind those kinds of things. You can deal with it from an outcome point of view and say, look, there's a whole bunch of outcomes we need to achieve. But when we're, when we're in, the, in the high school example, uh, the, the real game changer on high school graduations is grade, grade, grade three. And uh, contextually to a, to a neighborhood, if you're looking uh, at a neighbor, at neighborhood development, you might start to think, well, what would be a, uh, where do we start? What would be a real game changer in, in this neighborhood work? Uh, that would have a cascading effect, and in that context, it could very well be that a neighborhood hub is the game changer approach to take in a particular neighborhood for the reason that uh, those doing it have determined. Yeah, yeah, Mark, I like, I think that this is an excellent question to end on uh, because it is an orientation to the work, a game changer mindset with possibly when you do the work, some illustrative examples, but the, the it is not any one strategy. Whether a game changer works in Edmonton or Calgary or Toronto or Medicine Hat or, or uh, uh, Digby depends on the context. So it's the game changer is a, a way of thinking about the work with a bunch of process implications, but people will have to make choices and do the work to feel comfortable with those choices on what a game changer is in their community. Yeah, I, I totally agree, and I think the, the game changer approach uh, is 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 really trying to help us understand where we can have the biggest impact. But I think we we have to recognize that we, we when we make choices, we have we do have to uh, leave some things behind, and that's really hard for us. Like when you're in the helping business, you want to do everything possible to help, and uh, I think sometimes we create an, our own environment. That that in a sense waters down our efforts because we're trying to do so much. So it also yeah. takes some discipline to uh, yeah. to be able to say yes to to the big things and no to other things. Mark, terrific! It, that was a great one to end on. Uh, we are now at time, uh, which brings us to the end of our question period. Thank you again for contributing to this this national discussion on poverty re reduction and this inserting this concept of the game changer um, into the language and thinking, both from the perspective of evaluation and also just strategic thinking. And thanks to all of you who attended today as well and your, your thoughtful questions. Uh, Mark, you've made a real contribution. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks to everybody for attending. And please look for materials that are coming out from us and feel free to engage in dialogue with us about this as we try to move forward. Well, and I'll, I'll add to that I, a couple of announcements as we leave. Uh, as mentioned before, there's a couple of great ways to keep in touch with vibrant communities and the city reducing poverty uh, membership. Uh, to stay up to date with the latest thinking and the news and the tools and resources, subscribe to the VC monthly newsletter, Cities Connect, and to join the Vibrant Communities online learning community for poverty reduction practitioners, go to www.vibrantcommunity.ca, and that's on the, the screen there. Uh, over to the next slide. If you enjoyed today's webinar, you might be interested in evaluating community impact uh, three-day workshop coming to Hamilton, Ontario from November 15th to the 17th. This is one of Tamarack's signature three-day events. I think it's our fourth year of running it. I think it's our ninth or tenth time doing this one, uh, which always evolves. And it explores the latest thinking and evaluation of complex change initiatives. And it's hosted by Liz Weaver and myself. Uh, we hope that you walk away from that session with foundational ideas and key principles and tools for evaluating change, uh, some of which we talked about today, such as most significant change. 
uh, and this is really targeted for anyone out there who have initiatives that need to be evaluated and are working in a collaborative environment and are interested in that very important intersection between the reality of what community change looks like and the, re the reality of what robust evaluation looks like in those contexts. Um, let's go to the next uh, webinar. We have another one coming up and uh, this one is a Vibrant Communities webinar which is looking at the Parkdale People's Economy Project which is a neighborhood-based initiative in one of Toronto's last remaining low-income inner-city neighborhoods. Uh, it uses, it focuses on a community land trust model which is an idea that's been around for a while but is, is gaining credibility and an alternative currency uh, as well as a local food, uh, food system and more. So it's a comprehensive story and uh, all based on a collective social infrastructure and a, a set of economic alternatives that prize putting the community in control. We'll be joined by Victor Willis, Executive Director of PARC. Again, that's the Parkdale Action Recreation and he'll share with us their lessons learned and challenges about how to move beyond their organizational barriers to build equitable economies in Toronto. Last uh, note, in a few days you're going to receive an email with a link to an audio recording of today's call and you may also email Allison, A-L-I-S-O-N, at tamaracommunity.ca to provide feedback on today's session. Everyone, it's a Friday. Thank you once again for taking time out to join us. Have a good day and have a good weekend.